instantaneous. Why don't we go ahead and get started? I want to thank everyone for being here today. Um, so we'll go ahead and open the meeting at 3.31, April 13th. So we'll call the meeting to order at that time. Just a, a comment to make for those that are virtual. If I don't acknowledge any member raising their hands, especially those attending virtually, I promise I'm not ignoring you. <laughs> it is more likely I don't see you. So I appreciate anyone bringing the, this unacknowledged to my attention. Um, roll call of the board members. Is Hannah, are you online? I don't see you. Other than that, Sally is excused and Councilman Bingle is also excused. Everyone else is here present. So additions or deletions to the agenda. So following a very productive discussions covering the Upper River Dog Park site and park property classifications at our March retreat, Jerry and I met with the parks team to determine the most effective next step. These two topics were both potential action items for the April Land Committee, but we felt that they should go to the full board for discussion today. So the following changes to the regular order of business will be in place for today's meeting. There will be an open forum for topics not on the agenda, and that will immediately precede the consent agenda approval. Public comment relating to agenda topics will follow the presentations by park staff. We feel listening to and understanding the presentations before commenting on their effectiveness would be the best format. All comments and questions, either supportive of or contrary to, will take place following the park staff presentations as listed under the special discussion action heading. There will not be a vote on these two topics at this meeting, and based on today's discussion, their placement on the land committee agenda as an action item will be determined, with May 3rd being the initial opportunity. Any questions from anyone on that? So let's move ahead then to the, we'll go to the open, open forum, and that will be public comment on non-agenda items, and those would be the ones under the special discussion. Okay, I have two, Susan Matthews and uh, Molly Marshall, so either one, if you are here and want to do a presentation. We are asking people to limit their comments to two minutes. We do have quite a few people, I believe, wishing to speak today. So if you would go right up to the mic, if you would, and introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sue Matthews, and I am here um, to request a little bit more pickleball resources for the community. I know uh, the parks has a lot of important things that they have to do, but there is a huge population of I think more senior, but, but all ages love pickleball. Mm -hmm. I see families over at Comstock in the evenings uh, having the best time. So it's not just all seniors. Um, I I've, I've understand that there have been discussions with different members of the Parks Board, and it's been a pretty firm no. We don't have money in the budget. We don't have money in the budget for more you know, courts for more even um, replacement of the nets that were given to us last year or the year before, I'm not sure when that was. Um, but I would request that the parks possibly consider lining all the tennis courts at both Comstock and Mission Park so that we have some space to, to play pickleball when tennis isn't going on. Um, really, we pay taxes as much as the tennis people do. I don't think there was ever a fund uh, raised by tennis people to make those courts. So I think we, 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 we've got a place on those courts as, as much as they do. I, I know some signage may need to be made in the future because pickleball in the communities that actually have courts is growing so fast that there's been some um, 
uh, problems with sharing the courts, but um, we would really appreciate it. In the summer, most, or at least our group, is kicked out of the facilities that we use in the winter time. Those are used by children. Um, we, a lot of us are at the warehouse right now, and those, those summer camps run at the warehouse all summer, and so we really don't have our winter place to go unless we go south or something like that. But um, anyway, uh, so if, if, would it be possible for the board to, I don't think it would cost a lot of money, and the, the painted courts at Comstock are awesome, except one of them is starting to kind of fall apart on the south, uh, southwest side. Um, but, um, and I haven't actually been to Mission Park, but that's a nice tennis facility, I understand. And I know Comstock Park is gonna be um, having tennis lessons all summer, so we really won't be able to use those courts at all um, unless the young man or the woman who is giving the lessons allows us to. So um, we may have to go to mission this year anyway. Yep. So. Thank you, Susan. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Molly Marshall next. Hi there. My name is Molly Marshall, and I'm a member of Citizen Action for Lataw Valley called CALV, a nonprofit group with over 1,500 members advocating for responsible building and adequate infrastructure in the Lataw Valley. This unique area of Spokane has a deep geological and human history. It is home to people who deeply appreciate the attributes and treasures of conveniences to downtown the airport, balanced with a rural fill, active farming, a vibrant wildlife corridor, home to moose, deer, osprey, bald eagles, and many other creatures. Despite what should be protected, preserved, and a wisely planned for evolution of this area, the Lataw Valley is under tremendous pressure by the City of Spokane and development interests whose mm. pursuits are threatening not only the integrity and specialness of this area, but literally the lives of the people and wildlife who call Lataw Valley home, and it deserves to be protected. With almost 2,000 new homes in the permitting process, mm. this is a critical time and opportunity for the Parks Department to get involved by protecting natural lands, establishing parks, collecting impact fees, and implementing the park dedication ordinance, as most of the new development in Lata Valley is occurring on undeveloped land with an abundance of green space that can be set aside with these developments. The Lata Valley has been identified in the park's master plan as underserved, lacking a city-owned park property. Over 80% of the Lata Hangman residents are outside a 10 minute walk access to a city owned park. This area is also considered a special habitat conservation zone and is considered a very high priority area for conservation. There is also an important opportunity to partner with Spokane Public Schools as they are considering building a new elementary school next to Qualchin Park. This would be a valuable addition to the Lata Valley as there are no schools in the entire area. Every student is bused to the South Hill or Cheney. Finally, the parks is probably the most primed agency to become stewards of the agricultural land in the valley, such land that has become almost non-existent in urban settings, even though local food production access is a critical reality for the future of communities everywhere. The Lake Tahoe Valley currently offers a tremendous opportunity for recreation and preservation, attractive elements for the current residents and the others that will be coming. It will take a collaborative effort with city agencies, departments, and the residents. Now is the time to act before the undeveloped land is gone, the wildlife corridors are lost, and the agricultural lands disappear. And I just add one last thing, and I just talked to uh, Nick Hamad, and we just really encourage people in the Parks Department to um, comment during the SEPA process as these 2,000 new homes are being developed um, to identify the gaps and level of ser service issues associated with these developments. Thank you, Molly. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we will, that's all the comments we have that are part of the form. Okay, so we will pro proceed to the cons consent agenda. We do have 10 action items on the consent agenda. If there is any board member that would like to edit the current consent agenda. All right. If not, I will move to approve the current consent agenda as written. I'll second that. Thank you, Terry. Any other comments? 
All those in favor, respond with aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that passes unanimously, thank you. Now we do have a special guest is on our next agenda item, and that will be Kelly Brown with the Friends of Manitou Annual Review. So come on up, please, Kelly. Thank you. It feels like a year went by really, really fast, and I just did this <laughs> yeah. last week, so. Um, All right, well, we had a really great year. Um, we were able to resume our educational lecture series, which the Friends of Manitou has historically done for a very long time, but they were on halt during COVID. So last year we brought back our programming. Um, we had goals to increase our Holiday Lights sponsorship. Um, we wanted to create new ways to steward our donors um, we announced an endowment and we rebranded our organization and we um, had a retreat to redefine our mission and our purpose. And wow. we had a goal to increase our vendor participation at our art festival. Um, so we um, recruited a board member from Spokane Public Schools and she's amazing and she organized four different children's workshops in Manitou Park. And this was a sponsored event. Um, we announced these classes and they filled up within 10 minutes each. So um, very popular, kids love the park, parents love their kids to be out in the park, um, so they were a hit. Um, we brought back our adult education series and those were at the park and we also partnered with Spokane Public Library and we had classes on composting, macro photography and native plants in our gardens. Um, something that I am very proud about is our Manitou Park Art Festival. Last year was our second year. Um, the first year we dealt with extreme heat and smoke. Um, and then the second year, if you were to look at the forecast the day leading up to the event, it said that there was going to be a lightning bolt for every hour of the day. Um, it was set out to be a horrible day. Um, I went to bed feeling kind of terrible, had really hateful emails all day but when i woke up the sun was out and i say that there was a heart over spokane that day if you look at the radar but i think i'm a little bit crazy there probably wasn't um we had a really great turnout we partnered with different groups to facilitate children's art education um we had some special visitors there the spokane indians mascots were there and danced around with children um this year, we are excited to continue all of those themes and we're partnering with the refugee community to um, showcase their works of art as well. Um, one of our main themes we wanted to focus on this year was donor stewardship. Um, so we found ways to recognize and honor and celebrate our donors. So we um, introduced an annual event that will take place in the Japanese garden with our major donors. We hold a spring picnic for our longtime members. And then we, of course, have an open house for um, our holiday light sponsors and donors as well. And we were back for the third year of Holiday Lights, and that was, once again, a hit. Um, we were sponsored by Providence, Washington Trust Bank, and Wagstaff, and then we had some in-kind support as well. We had live music, a Santa visit, and food vendors for food and hot drinks, and it was a great event with nearly 50,000 attendees. Wow. That's amazing. Wow. <laughs> um, so 
I mentioned, and you've probably seen it to a nauseating degree if you've received any of our emails, um, but we went through a branding process this last year, and that was really exciting for us because we never really went through a branding. Um, so we started with a retreat um, with our board members to talk about where we want to be in 20, 30 years from now. Um, we uh, facilitated surveys to our members, our donors. We met with city council members, Visit Spokane, park board members, um, the parks department to get input. And we took that back and we formed a branding committee and um, that was funded through private donations. Um, and we came up came up with a new mission, which is essentially similar to our own, but it's more beautiful. Um, so our mission is to conserve and enhance the beauty and functionality of Manitou Park for present and future generations. We created a vision statement, which we did not have before. Um, we wanna make sure that Manitou Park persists in beauty and provides quality of life as needs, circumstances, and times change. And we also introduced some values, which we did not have before. Um, Stewardship, education, partnership, and participation are all things that we think are important to incorporate into all the decisions we make. Um, so when we took all of this information to our branding committee, we decided that we should come across as down to earth, not too formal and not too stuffy, friendly <laughs> and warm and open and passionate, um, but knowledgeable and capable about our park, which we cheerlead for. Um, we strive to foster enthusiasm and passion, pride in our regional treasure, connections to the park, and a desire for um, others to get involved in our work. So just for fun, um, in our branding committee, we went through several different logos um, before we landed on the winner. Um, some of them were too busy, some of them looked like targets, um, some just had way too much going on, some were too cheesy. Some were like almost right, but the butterfly's body was not the right way. Um, and this is what we eventually oh, landed nice. on, and we love it so much. And it really just represents us as pollinators, um, nourishing and flourishing the Manitou Park and making it better and beautiful forever. So. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Um, as you know, we opened up an endowment at the Anovia Foundation, and this was um, great work with Garrett and Al, and it was timely with your master plan coming out because we learned that the best way for us to support Manitou Park was to contribute to the operations, the maintenance, and the ongoing things that people want to keep Manitou Park just as beautiful as it is. Um, so we opened up this endowment um, with full knowledge that we might all be gone before we reach our goal, um, but we're laying the groundwork for um, a beautiful tree that we might not ever sit under. So um, proud to mm. proud to lay the roots for whoever comes next. A lot of puns. Um, something else exciting that we are in the very beginning process of working on is a children's pollinator garden. Um, and this spot already exists um, off of the perennial garden. It's a butterfly garden, so it needs a little bit of a facelift. Um, so we are going to work on fundraising for that. And if you come to Manitou Park anytime in the late spring when it's nice out and the early summer before school gets out, you see kids and tour buses, school buses um, in Manitou Park with kids on field trips. So it's just a perfect way to offshoot of the perennial garden that already exists. Um, but give more thought into the space. Um, and I would be not doing my job if I didn't plug our upcoming plant sale on June 3rd and the art festival on June 10th. Um, so the numbers for the year, our plant sale income was um, a little over 150,000. We had 9,000 in art festival income. Sponsorships from art festival were 5,000. Holiday lights donations, a little over 9,000. Holiday Light sponsorship income was 50,000. General donations were 48,000. Membership fees for our members, um, 19,000. And we had 6,684 volunteer hours. So there's a lot of hands that go into making those numbers possible. Mm -hmm. Um, so we just want to say thank you for letting us be a part of your team and helping you fulfill your mission because we all love Manitou Park and we're so happy to have it as one of our flagship parks here in Spokane. Wow, Kelly. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Wow, this great, is how it's done, folks. <laughs> oh, wow. Now we need the friends of
Kelly, you do continue to raise the bar for everyone else. <laughs> oh, well, thank, thank you, you very much for all you and everyone else, friends of Manitou, and not just from the park board, but I think the whole city of Spokane is quite happy with what you're doing there. Thanks. Yeah. Well, we're just lucky that we have a Manitou park because not every city has one. So. Yeah. Thank you so thank much, you, Kelly. Kelly. All right. Now will be the financial report, Rich, and you get to follow Kelly. Good <laughs> luck with that one, but. Uh... <laughs> For those that don't know, Rich is new to the city's and park board staff. Uh, this is actually his first presentation to the park board. having me tough act to follow there <laughs> yeah. so yeah, yeah first uh first run at this so i'm only taking easy questions today so <laughs> save the hard ones for next month i sent barb a couple in advance you just did, to and I was softball <laughs> maybe ask this if it comes like up <laughs> there you go so no um real similar data to what mark always presented i kind of put a little different look and feel to it so i'm a clean slate and i don't have any ruts formed yet so if you like it or dislike it, now's the time to speak freely because <laughs> anything's open to change, but I hope you like the new format of it. I think it kind of paints the picture kind of in a more clear format, but the same day that you've always gotten before, so that didn't change. Nice logo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Almost as good as Kelly. I went through my own rebranding. <laughs> <laughs> so this slide here, before you saw each of the three on a separate slide, so the first two gray bars was its own slide, the two middle green, and then the far right two, we're all presented independently. I think there is some value in kind of looking at it together. You can kind of see how they correlate to each other. Mm -hmm. So same idea. And then I had kind of my own three key concepts on the bottom there. Just if you missed the meeting or didn't want to take notes, kind of what I felt maybe the top two to four every month concepts that I think are mm -hmm. of most value to know. So really on this one, kind of starting with those first two. And for all these, I kept the same kind of theme. So everything gray is expenses. Everything in green is revenues. So those first two there, I think, kind of summed up well in that second bullet point. So operating expenses are 264000 above last year to date. And really, about 90% of that is in salaries and wages, which that's a known event. We all know we had cost of living increases last year and wage increases. I think the important part of that number is we don't want to get too caught up in the number that that was budgeted for and we planned on that. And as a percent of budget, it's only 0.1% above last year's budget. So the dollar amount looks big, but that was planned for and budgeted for. And then second one in the middle, that's the revenues. So you don't see this number on here, but just comparing it to last year only, year to date, it's ahead of revenues by just about 41,000. And then if you look at a two year budget average, we're 196,000 ahead of that schedule. So revenues are looking strong. And then when you combine those to kind of get the summary on the last one there, year-to-date revenues are at 5.27 million and year-to-date expenses about 3.8 million. So year-to-date surplus of about 1.47 million, which is really kind of right on budget and expected for this time of year with most of the major expenditures not happening until the summer months. Any questions on parks before I go to golf? So the golf fund, I think I could probably sum up in it's been cold. That's kind of the summary of the entire golf fund. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we just leave it at that. Welcome winner. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> but no, really same concept on this. I put all three golf slides onto one. Uh, so you can kind of see the expenditures there on, I guess, the left column and the far right one. So we are tracking right on pace with expenses. And then kind of that middle bullet point, we did have that 255000 outlay for the pine beetle removal. So I think that's some... Mm -hmm. Optimism there that you take that out of those expenses and we're tracking really well with expenses. Um, the middle one there, that's where you can kind of see where the challenge is at. We've got some catch up to do. So two year budget average is about 720,000 in revenue and we're about 380,000. So in terms of rounds played, I think we're about one third of where we were last year. And actually I did insert one more slide to show that a little bit easier for you. 
And then final bullet point there. Actually, I need to update that when I wrote that three of the four are open. I think four or four are open now, so help us out and get out and play some golf. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is kind of just my wild card slide. We do have some new uh, reporting software that we're working with our BI teams in IT hmm. that we might have some improved capabilities to show some dashboard reporting for you. So this is an example that came from that dashboard. This is the golf slide. And really all it's showing you is the gray is not really telling much of a picture. That's just total items sold. So mm -hmm. merchandise, bucket of balls, that could be anything, just total items sold. But really the green kind of tells the story. So for the past five years, and that's 18 whole rounds purchased through March. So if you look at this year, we're about one third of last year and maybe a fourth of where we're the year prior to that. So oh, like some catch up to do, but mm -hmm. I think we've got uh, a lot of optimism and everything's open now, so brighter days are ahead. <laughs> That's everything I had. Any wow, questions? you passed your initiation. Thank you, yes. Rich. Well done. <laughs> Thank any, you. any questions for Rich before we? No, I like your attempts, though, at just making it easier to read. Thanks. And, it. you know, uh, also more self-explanatory. So thank you for your efforts. Appreciate it. Yeah, we have a lot of data, so if more or less you want to see, just let me know. Thanks, Rich. All right, thank you very much, Thanks. Rich. Great. Thanks. All right, we will now move to the special discussion action items. And when Nick Hammond has completed his presentation, he'll start with the Upper River Drive Dog Park. When he's completed that presentation, then we will open it up to public comments regarding that dog park. Thank you, Bob. I've got Greg Forsyth with Spokane Public Schools here today Welcome as well. Again, Greg. Uh, Greg will be available to answer any questions as needed as well. Almost there. Do you even want to read them all? Or do I need to? Okay. Okay. Update on the South Hill, the official South Hill dog park. Today we've got for you, you know, an uh, update on the temporary dog park site. Some of you may have seen this before if you've attended some of our community meetings. Um, there have been um, uh, some additions toward the end of this as well. Um, give you an update on our site selection process give you an overview of the recent feedback we've received, and then some preliminary recommendations. And today, we do have preliminary, preliminary recommendations for this board. We are not asking for action yet. We are making those recommendations to make it known what our intention is there and provide an opportunity for those who are interested to provide feedback. So you can gather that feedback. We can then uh, use that feedback over the next month to hopefully come back to you with an official recommendation as, as early as May. <clears throat> Of course, the temporary dog park site is open at this time. This is you know, directly adjacent the construction of a new middle school. Um, it is in, uh, the intention of Spokane Public Schools to keep the dog park, the temporary dog park, open until we find a new replacement facility. Uh, the blue area there was the temporary dog park before I, the construction of a new access road, which is going in with the fire lane and utilities for that school. Um, I believe that access road is under construction now. Um, and so there are other provisions being made up in the northwest corner of that block that's at 63rd and Regal for a new temporary dog park location there to continue to accommodate that access over the next couple of months. So they're working to preserve as much space as possible. Um, during that time, we're continuing to search for a seven plus acre treed natural feeling space for a community sized dog park. Something that is easy, easily accessible by vehicle and has some parking or ha could have car parking created. It could be fenced and buffered from other uses. That is a site that you can walk around on, right? That is gonna be walkable for the users and that protects habitat to the extent we can and that has utilities available if possible. Of course, there were the three top-ranked sites on the South Hill. None of those three sites really, though they turned out to be meeting the criteria of a dog park on a piece of paper, none of them, when we went to you know, really look at public feedback and engage the citizens, were, were feasible for folks. There were uh, unanimous opposition at both uh, uh, Hazel's Creek and Underhill, and then sort of moderate uh, support at Lincoln. But you know, 
displacement of quite a quite a lot of uh, of natural space in that area, and and really it was determined by the park board and the public that the preservation of that natural land in that location was more was preferable to a dog park. So at this point, since the adoption, I would say it's been a year since we adopted the MOU with Spokane Public Schools in the city to find a dog park location. To put that in context, um, our consultants have of course completed their work citywide analysis there. Um, you've adopted that last October. We've met with our project advisory committee a number of times that did include reps from every single city council district, both bo uh, dog users and non. And then we also included a service provider and a vet in that as well. Uh, we do incorporate public survey. We've had five public open houses now with about 250 participants. And then uh, we've received 75 individual comment cards. I think that's higher now, but that's what we, we have reported as of last. Um, we've touched with a number of neighborhood councils, of course, land committee and this board. With the top three sites in the South Hill uh, not being viable, we really started looking at county options. We spent quite a lot of time over the winter months looking at county options and determined that after evaluating six, six to eight locations, none of them were going to be feasible uh, via partnership to be able to accomplish a dog park in any of those locations. So we started looking even more broadly, which was north and uh, looking at existing facilities, potential of renovating High Ridge as an option there. Um, significant renovations may be an option at that facility. So this is what was presented, these top two remaining options that are close to the South Hill presented to the uh, public workshop or the public open house um, this last month up near Mullen Road Elementary. Upriver Park was one of those. It's 20 minutes from the old official, uh, unofficial South Hill Dog Park site. It's the largest potential piece of land we have available. Um, it's the flattest potential piece of land we have available. It does not have access to water, and it would require a new parking lot because it's next to Shields Park, which is existing many ha, -ha climbing rocks, and we certainly don't want to displace other users from something they're already doing to accommodate dogs. So it would need to have a parking lot constructed as a part of uh, any sort of improvement. Um, you can see in the image on the screen that there's a dash blue line um, with a shaded area in it, and that is the area we're considering for evaluating for the potential, a portion thereof to be a dog park. All the land on the screen you see is owned by the Parks Department with the exception of this little piece right here, which is private property. And per our guidelines adopted by the board, we would want to have at least a couple hundred foot buffer from any private property to any sort of dog park so that we don't have dogs right next to somebody's private property. That's just not good practice for our users or for the private property. Um, we also have identified Evergreen East Mountain Bike Alliance, who's a major user of the Beacon Hill area, major programmer, has one of their trails that is a uh, single track bike trail across the property as well. And we did connect with them this last Monday. Uh, we talked with them about this proposal. Um, we believe that there's adequate room for us to maintain that trail as it stands today and still create a dog park. Um, and Evergreen East was, was happy with the proposal. They didn't, they didn't have any objections to any of the proposal. They actually expressed um, support to that, uh, that proposal. So right now, they, what we did here was, you know, you've got some dumping going on on that site now, so positive use is better than no use. And, it's not affecting us, so we're okay with that, at least that one particular stakeholder. There are certainly others. There is Spokane Mountaineers who uses, uh, a lot of the climbing coalitions use uh, Minnehaha and Shields Park, and we have reached out to them. We have not yet heard back. We expect we will before May, so we'll report that when we do. Um, this is another look at that upriver park option. This is a Ponderosa pine stand. It's good ex uh, south-facing exposure, relatively flat. You're going to see dryland grasses, some arrow leaf balsam root, and a number of those sort of typical endemic species to our area within this uh, parcel. Really what we're looking at here is a parking lot in an area that's pretty heavily disturbed. We have a m sort of mud, dirt parking lot there now. And then we are looking at fencing fencing around the perimeter of the space. But there's no proposal, I don't think, to regrade this whole site or remove a lot of trees. I think we're really looking to keep it in as, as natural a state as possible. Here's an image looking from Upriver Drive. 
Highbridge was the other option. It's slightly closer to the dog park site on, on 57th and Regal, uh, or near 57th and Regal, I should say. It's a renovation of an existing facility. We as staff felt we could put substantial resources toward improving that location to incre uh, improve access, um, improve security, improve amenities at that location without having to develop you know, a whole facility. It's already got fencing and whatnot, but that wouldn't bring a new facility online. That would be a remodel of something that we own. There's also the proposal for the future American Indian Community Center, of course, which this board is aware of, which would be a great neighbor for a dog park like this. Um, of course, the dog park is already there. Um, AICC is moving forward in fundraising, you know, regardless of what we do here. And so um, there are some, some good options for this location. We have better access to water. We could really make, I, I, was, I would say, you know, Barry's word, we could have a lot of pop and sizzle at this location if we were to direct resources into it. Um, but when we ask folks at our community meeting what their preferences were, I would say it was not their number one. We'll get to that here in just a second. One of the things we recognize is that neither of these locations are near where the unofficial dog park was located. And that's a big void. And so as Spokane Public Schools made a, a very generous offer, which was we would like to build a neighborhood dog park site right near where the old one was, so that folks that live in that neighborhood that are used to going to a facility that's been there for a long time have access to continue to do that. Um, they'd like to do that. It's about a 1.8 acre parcel, though the dog park would be slightly smaller than that. Um, they would do that if the park board was willing to accept that property and care for that property in perpetuity. So that's part of the deal there would be SPS builds it, we take over that facility as our property. So that would be um, a question for you if you're interested in that, and that would be part of the, the proposal. So when we ask for the preferences between upriver and high bridge, and then of course with this idea of a neighborhood dog park in either scenario, we heard really strong preference for upriver park. We heard concerns really primarily around safety at High Bridge, and there was also concerns that said, you know, we've already got a dog park there. We'd like to add to our level of service. We see the need for more than one of these things, and we know in our own planning we recommend at least one in each of the three city council districts, so Upriver would be adding a new facility to our existing inventory, and there was a strong preference amongst our open house uh, attendees for Upriver Park. Of course, recognizing that they're compromising quite significantly on the location when compared to the original uh, location. So what we've heard, Upper River Park was preferred by 78% of our open house participants, which is a wide margin. There are some that are concerned about the environmental impact that could potentially occur on that site at Upper River Park. There are also those that are just generally concerned about how far away it is from the South Hill. Both of those are valid concerns. So those are the biggest criticisms we heard about that location amongst those that do not support that site. Um, South Hill Neighborhood Dog Park at 63rd was generally appreciated by a number of the neighbors, and we got comments to that respect on the comment cards. So that seems to have struck a, a positive chord and I think maybe opened up some minds about, you know, is a, a location farther away a priority or, or acceptable? Um, and then feedback from the neighborhood councils. We're actively seeking that still. I'm meeting with the Minnehaha neighborhood tonight. Uh, we're also meeting with the Chief Gary neighborhood. We have connected with a couple of stakeholders, most recently Evergreen East um, and some of our council members. We've been hearing mostly positive things. We haven't heard opposition from those groups yet, but we haven't heard from all of them. So we'll, we'll continue to do that. Um, we have heard previously from the Minnehaha neighborhood council closest to Upriver Park um, that they actually wanted a dog park in Minnehaha Park, which is just down the road. So generally speaking, they said, well, yeah, we, you know, we already want one of these things. So would you be considering it here? We might be supportive. So again, more, of the, more to come on that front, and we'd like to give you their actual comments, not my interpretation of it. So that'll come here in the next couple of weeks. So does this make sense on our master plan? We're just wrapping up here. Um, adding a dog park meets goal B objective one in the master plan. It is in district one, a first tier project priority for according to our master plan. We know district one has a higher need than other districts for these sorts of improvements. And so there are high uh, priority recommendations in our master plan to that effect. So this is where we are as staff. We anticipate recommending Upriver Park as the 
official South Hill dog park location, even though it's slightly north of the river. And we also anticipate recommending the park board accept donation of 2616 East 63rd. That is a property associated with that neighborhood dog park uh, facility. So those are the two recommendations we anticipate making, and I'll stop talking. <laughs> Any board member questions for Nick before we open it for public comment? Nick, I know there was a concern raised earlier about potential wildlife corridors in the upriver location. Have you looked into that? We have, and one of the benefits that we have in the upriver park location, and I don't have a map to show you today, but one of the things we've been doing is working with the county to acquire a lot of land in that area, and so we actually own several hundred acres of contiguous property with conservation easement across that area. So there are significant corridors where wildlife can still continue to move, even despite this proposal. Mm -hmm. um, and I would also note that the, the land itself classified as one of our major parks there, or excuse me, regional parks. So that's looking at like a riverfront or looking at a high bridge or Manitou type facility there. So I think, I think we can do both. Okay, thank you. And also, has the private property owner been contacted? No. Okay. Other questions? I should say this, the whole neighborhood got notified. Everybody in a certain area got mailers regarding our, our meeting with Minnehaha neighborhood, but I, I haven't contacted them specifically. We could certainly do some door knocking. But they got a mailer, yeah. so they know it's there. Okay. Yeah. No, I would just like to make a comment, Nick. Thank you for your efforts. Mm -hmm. I mean, coming back, uh, presenting in this manner uh, is far more formidable, if you will. Uh, sure. And sure. it gives us, um, at this point, those of us who've done our homework, you know, much broader picture and things that have been uh, pinholes, if you will, that were questions from the last time. Sure. So uh, just kudos to all your work and That's the support our job. team we'll keep with doing you. It. <laughs> Any other? Thank you, Nick, for your presentation. Um, so we will move to public comments. Again, as with the other one, um, if you would try to limit it to two minutes, um, we do have quite a few people commenting. I know Garrett pointed out that I do have a list of the people that filled out the, the cards. He said some had told him they do not want to comment, so whatever, once your name is called, if you would, you know, if you don't want to comment, that's fine. Maybe just acknowledge that, that you're here so we don't, you know, go over the top of you without letting you have your time to speak. And hopefully I do the names correctly. If not, I apologize in advance. So the very first one is Cheryl McEachin. If you would, please. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay. And I'm not as knowledgeable as all these people. I, um, Everyone has an opinion, so hopefully <laughs> yeah. please do. Well, and I really appreciate the effort that's gone into this. I want to thank everyone involved. Um, and I'm going to try to make it brief. I'm sharing a few memories from the heart because it led me to what I thought was important. And um, I started probably going to the South Hill Dog Park when I found out about it almost 20 years ago. Um, my mother was in touch, Mark. Um, and I had an old dog and a young dog. The space was perfect for them because one could run and one could, you know, waddle. Um, and I had a lot of time to think and reflect. And, and the day that they closed that park, because by then I was working part-time with several seniors. I'm a senior, but they were older seniors. <laughs> um, they, um, there was a lot of crying that day. And it was all from old people. And to this day, it breaks my heart. And there was even a guy who had Alzheimer's whom we all watched out for because it was such a safe space for seniors hmm. that they, the care, the the wife felt comfortable leaving his dog and him, and we all kind of watched out for him. Um, so there's two parts of me. One is no one hardly ever thinks about senior communities. Well, they do, but maybe not enough. And a lot of the senior community came to that area. The benches were wonderful for resting. They were under shade trees, which was wonderful. And so I don't know a lot about the South Hill Neighborhood Park, but if it's that little strip of land that was on the other side of the cemetery, they might want to, cons it, if I understood it correctly, it looks like you're considering both. And I would love to see both accepted. We have a big city with a lot of dogs and a lot of people. And the range of ages and the range of needs, and my husband's disabled, so the range of handicaps. Pe 
I, I hope that all goes into consideration. And that would apply for people and dogs, because mm -hmm. dogs come to the park and you have, like I have a disabled dog, um, old age, like the rest of us, right? And I had a dog not that long ago I lost. He was 19 years old, but he had cognitive canine disorder, which is a doggy form of Alzheimer's. And, um, and I have a younger dog that runs constantly, but all rescues. But um, it really helps people. And I was really happy to see the thing about paths, to have a, a, a big path around the outer edge of the park if you want to go slower and you don't want a lot of dogs running up to your dog because you need that kind of protective area. Mm -hmm. It helps reduce the amount of issues there might be between dogs. It helps to have an open area. I'm sure you all know this. Yep. Um, so I was really happy to see all of that addressed. So I guess the only thing I'm coming up here to say is, um, oh, and I'm a North Sider. I, I went to the mm -hmm. South Hill Dog Park because it was the best park I could find for the various needs of people and dogs. Thank you, Cheryl. So we anyway, kind of got to the time. You, thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, our next one is Vicki Hunt. This morning we went and looked at both parks. My one concern with, um, you think I'm short? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, sir. Just reinforce that. <laughs> <laughs> um, my one concern is the parking, how on the, we went out there this morning up at the upriver, and there's that golf course that disc golf course and there was just solid traffic just solid so to pull off and get our dogs out of the car just on the highway it, it kind of made me nervous my dogs like this big and the other dog is crazy so um, I hope that that's in consideration it goes back far enough and you can put some big rocks or something up there so they don't get in the highway that was a I didn't realize there was so much traffic it's built up so bad, much since I've been out there but I think if we can get it you know down to where we can make it walkable and that sort of thing it would be just fine we don't care about there's no water we don't we never had it anyway we always brought our own so and the other park at Highbridge just isn't it, it's Lovely. The little park is very nice, and I understand it, but I don't think that we feel real safe there. Um, there's just not the population. And the people that go there tell me they've really never had any problems, except when it's hot, for the, they come up from, pe from People's Park and get water, etc. But the security there is not, there isn't any, and it was very, the garbage was real full and you know there's not much hardly any parking there and if you're going to build that Indian Center on that one side there's not any room and the people there said that there was just at on the weekends there was nowhere to park you couldn't even get in there so those were my observations so if as long as the parking is right on the river that would be great thank so, you Vicki appreciate it the next one is Dietra Stewart. No, pass. Pass? Okay. Sharon Berquist. Oh, I'll pass. Okay. We I don't have a name on this. Uh, the person lives on G Grand Avenue. Might be me. Uh, the address, can I read that? Or? I, well, yeah, anything I read. Uh, oh, did you want to speak? Or? <laughs> if you can read it. It just says 3311 South Grand. Is that? That's okay, me. there's just no name on there. Sorry. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. We don't like to give his name out. Yeah. <laughs> 
just his address. <laughs> but he gives his address, yeah. We'll be over tonight for dinner. My name, as commonly used, is Hey You. Uh, I'm, my name is Mike Rasmussen. I'm a retired uh, geologist. And the further I get into retirement, the more I need to be able to take my dog somewhere. Uh, our backyard is about 30 by 30. And having a place to take the dog has been really great. We're not far from what has been the dog park on the South Hill. I'm in favor of both of those um, recommendations. And I would encourage you to, to do them both, not choose one or the other. Uh, we, uh, we all, we, we need these things. And each would have a different character and would be more convenient or less convenient. I don't know. I went looking for Upriver Park today and I couldn't even find it. But I know it's there and <laughs> it sounds great. So I just want to say thanks for dealing with this issue. And I endorse both of these um, recommendations. And the issue of parking is a really important one. And I'd like to second that. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Much appreciated. Linda Valentine. Hello, my name is Linda Valentine and I'm a dog park user. I would like to express my vote verbally to move forward with the upriver location for our new dog park. It's the best location that allows us to have the least impact on the environment and natural land. It also does not displace land from any of our community that is currently being used by someone else. This has been a pretty long, arduous process <laughs> for most of us over a year. And putting our love and soul into our desires, we were met by a lot of people who didn't want their communities to change. They wanted to keep their areas that they currently had and keep them as they were for whatever reason, for the children, for the environment. And we respected that. We certainly understand that that's important. But now it's important for us to keep the promise of the dog park. And so I feel that the upriver location meets those needs. Um, moving forward with this, we need to make sure that this is something that Spokane be proud of. It needs to be a jewel. It is a big community of dog users, and I hope that you pass this and we do upriver and make it the jewel that it should be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. <laughs> uh, Nick Meek. Thank you for a moment of your time. I am also in favor of the upriver park. It has more room and um, the, the, the small area on the South Hill, didn't, I didn't see a tree there. Um, the old South Hill dog park went from 15 acres <clears throat> to five acres. Now it's down to about two acres. It'd be really nice to have Spokane known as a dog-friendly town. I think the revenue from that would uh, pay for everything and beyond um, whatever you can do to make up River Park a great dog park. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Trevor Marks. Good afternoon. Hey, thanks for your time. I appreciate you all being here. Uh, thanks to everybody who came. Uh, thanks to Nick and Greg and Garrett for everything, working with us through this. Uh, like we said, it's been a long process and everything. We really appreciate everybody's time. So. I won't take up too much of it. Uh, my name is Trevor Marks, not part of the large family in town. We're our own clan. Um, but um, I'm one of the uh, volunteer friends of the South Hill Dog Park Board members with a couple of us here. I'm speaking also on behalf of my wife, Lisa, who wasn't able to join us today. But um, anyways, I'm a Spokane born and raised guy. 
uh, South Hill my, all my life, still living there, and uh, a couple, we have a lot of roots up there. But um, I'm a local paramedic, I'm an instructor at a local college, and I have an emphasis on community paramedicine and community health care, uh, particularly in rural communities who don't have a lot of access to things. Uh, like yourselves, I share a passion for um, for getting access to resources that improve the quality of life of people, and I think that's why we're all here, because we care about that, those things that are vital to a community. Um, dog parks are just a wonderful and phenomenal resource that meet a lot of these needs. Uh, there is quite a large demand for these parks out there. Um, I think more than kind of meets the eye at times. A lot of people tend to go to these, but maybe not show up for these kind of events. But they're unique and wonderful, um, and we could really, you know, they really benefit the, what we have now in the surrounding area. We have a significant dog rescue population here, uh, including myself, Wilson, he's a good boy, you'd love him, hmm. and a couple of the others out here. It's great for all ages and families, um, and I've established some incredible personal friends and relationships from the dog park that have uniquely enriched my life uh, in such a unique way I never anticipated. Um, and that's one of the reasons it's so special to us. I think for us, Upriver would be a phenomenal option. Um, and I think a large majority of the park goers agree on that. Um, it meets a lot of the criteria that we've been looking for. It adds another park instead of narrowing things down to one in a really beautiful area that a lot of people like to access and be outside, including myself. I love Sakani Park for High Bridge. It's a beautiful area. Uh, I'm just about finished up here. Uh, it's in a different area of town that would give access to other neighborhoods and populations and communities that I think would really benefit of it. I truly believe that Upriver could be a signature landmark of Spokane. Uh, like a lot of other cities have, it can be just a wonderful thing that you can put on your city map and have pe that attracts people from all over. It's, it's incredible, the people who show up. And hopefully it sparks more interest across the city and maybe some further projects. So thank you a lot for your time. I appreciate everything. Thank you, Trevor. <laughs> and the uh, final sign-up one I have is Chad Mitchell. Trio. Yeah, you have to Chad sing Mitchell yours. You have to sing yours. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Probably heard that one before. Never going to live it down. <laughs> Please do. Well, I, um, uh, since I, I'm as old as I am, I can't speak that quickly. I can't even hear that quickly, as a matter of fact. Uh, I think everything has really been covered, and you, you hear the passion of, of these speakers. I don't need, I, oddly enough, don't have a dog in this fight. <laughs> it, uh, all of the dogs that I've taken there uh, uh, before um, in the last 20 years belong to my daughter. But as uh, parents, uh, which you probably know you very often, get the animal that your dog, uh, your children own. Anyway, um, it, I don't know how much uh, of the history you know. You probably know it all at this point, but I, I'll just point out that uh, I was one of 12 people who took their dogs to the original dog park site. And that, when the Internet hit, it went from 12 people to 1,500 people to 2,000 people. And to give you a, a scale of what that uh, has, has meant... Um, we use 50,000 to 60,000 dog poop bags a year. So that's a lot of poop if you want to <laughs> add that up. Anyway, when, when uh, the bond issue of, of 2018 came about and was passed, at that time the, uh, the uh, public schools, uh, Spokane Public Schools, uh, realized that our community was a very valuable asset and they said, we will relocate you to another site. They did that almost immediately, and I still have the plans for our dog park, which included about a fourth of the existing Pepperzac site, and the rest of it was out on the landfill. And that was good for about two years. And then a year and a half ago, Ecology told us we couldn't be on the landfill told the school district they couldn't be on the landfill either, and so they had to redraw the entire uh, site, and of course they had to take it all up. But everybody knew that, and, and I assume the park department knew too, because in their master plan they have planned for the fact that cities have really benefited by having really good dog parks. So 
they said, you will be the first dog park and your dog park will be the model on which the other dog parks will be built. Well, since our money came from the school bond, we said, great, now we can have it built before any, on, on whatever, whenever the next park bond is, I have no idea. But that will fund the other master plan uh, dog parks, I assume. So be that as it may, uh, my time is of the essence, by the way, uh, because we've been in this park for, I think, about a year and a half at this point. But Pepper's Act's going to open mm -hmm. this fall, and we're sitting on the we're sitting on land that needs to be developed for the opening of Pepper's Act. So we've been we've been promised that no one will move us until we have a place to go. Well, if we can be at the, I think, uh, the uh, upriver site, they can get right at that site, and we will be there. And but <laughs> we don't want to be the orphans running around in the desert of, of the South Hill Dog Park area. <laughs> I call it the South Hill has become a, a um, dog park desert. I guess we will have maybe a two-acre plot, hopefully. And, you know, we have appreciated the, uh, the many arguments that have presented, prevented a, a seven-plus acre uh, dog park site on the South Hill. We understand uh, what has happened. But our group, it, it, it seems to me that our group is always the one that, uh, whose priorities are never considered because the other, the other uh, neighborhoods or uh, groups that have, have presented their arguments against the dog park, have, have good arguments, but ours are, are never considered. So I'm hoping that somebody will consider and give us a priority on this dog park at Upriver. Thank you, Chad. Thank you. So that is all the write-in visitor sign-in cards that I have. Is there anyone online that that wanted to comment on this. Um, I noticed there was a few names on there that I didn't recognize earlier. If, if you wanted to comment on it, please do so now. If not, we'll move to the next presentation. All right, I will assume there's no one online that wants to comment on that. Oh, then we have, Garrett has a couple of uh, emails from groups that wanted them read tonight, so. If you would, Garrett. Absolutely. And Nick, and Nick touched on this, and this one's short and sweet, uh, from the Evergreen East Mountain Bikes Club. But they did say, we have no concerns about the proposed dog park at Upriver and totally support it. And another one, too, Councilmember Bingle, who is also in district, represents District um, 1, <clears throat> said last night, we want the dog park. I have contacted <laughs> all the adjacent neighborhoods and haven't heard one negative remark about the Upriver idea. As a matter of fact, it's only received positive responses today, to date. Please don't stop moving on siting and construction of the dog park in District 1. We want it. So that is from <laughs> Councilmember Bingle. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I appreciate everyone's comments, the respect you gave to keeping mostly within the timelines. I know that's not always easy, but thank you all very much. Your comments were very positive. Um, you were very honest with what you had to say, so thank you. So Nick, if you would do your next presentation and then we will have comments on that one. One thing we learned and relearned during the dog park process was how much we care for our natural lands too. So let's talk about that now. Uh, I really appreciate the time and, and, and effort, <clears throat> everybody here uh, and your time today to, to talk about this. When we talk about park classifications and park property development assessment, one of the things that came to our attention as staff is, is needing to just retouch with the board and then give you your options moving forward about how do we protect our lands, how do we decide how to build things. So the goal of this here is really just kind of brief you on what are the kinds of land that we have, um, what are your existing protections and authorities of the board protections for park land, and how could you augment those on natural lands if you desired to. 
Um, we'd also present some preliminary thoughts, staff recommendations on how we might improve our process to better respond to this. And we really want to get your feedback on this. So the whole point of this is to get your feedback before we do a whole lot of work so that we're not just doing work for no reason. Um, so park classifications. We have about 4,000 acres of park land citywide inside the city and outside the city. About 45% of those are classified as what we call natural lands. About 18% of those are golf courses. That one's pretty self-explanatory. So two-thirds of our land are golf course and natural land. The other third of our property is what we think of a park as being a properly developed park. So we've got that nice mix going on there. We've got about 1,800 acres, 1,750 of natural lands, and then the rest of them combined are about that other third, outside of 1,690 in golf courses. When you think about neighborhood parks, that's your traditional park, right? That's going to be somewhere between 4 and 15 acres. It's going to have a half a dozen or so amenities. And when we say amenities, we mean playgrounds, swing set, walking paths, picnic benches, that sort of thing. So your very traditional park setting is going to be your neighborhood park. And that is the bread and butter for me walking down the street to go play on the playground. A pocket park, I think Dutch Jake's Park here is a good example, is very much the same thing as a neighborhood park. It's just smaller. So we put these in locations where we don't have bigger chunks of land to try and extend some level of park service to folks within a 10-minute walk of their house. So we have a few of these around town, um, and some of them are more developed, some of them are less, but they're usually pretty small. A couple of city blocks, or excuse me, a couple of city lots. Your community park is your really for lack of a better term, your badass neighborhood park. That's your swimming pool and your library and all the extra parts and pieces that come with a park, your splash pads. So you think about, um, you know, Shadle, you think about Minnehaha, you think about Liberty, those sorts of locations. So they're going to have a little bit of extra flavor, a little bit of extra amenity, and they're usually larger, though we would merely classify parks by what's in them more so than size. So there's some overlap where you have some neighborhood parks that are bigger, and some community parks that are smaller. So AM Cannon is a good example of a community park that's a little small, but it's got all of the parts and pieces that you would expect in that higher level of service. Special use, you're talking pools, riverfront, sports complexes. These are special quantities that bring people from a large area. We're usually driving to these locations. There's probably some neighborhood park there. But there's a lot of, we're driving here for a very specific reason. Your Arboretum is another one of those. You're usually not putting those within 10 minutes of, of everybody. Parkway is pretty self-explanatory. Think Manitoba Boulevard. Think High Drive. It's going to be a nice driving experience and or a nice walking experience, a nice wide boulevard. Golf courses, I think we know what those are, playing golf on them. Some of them, when we're working to incorporate recreational trail access where we can, where it doesn't conflict with golf, but that's really a purpose-built facility. And then your regional parks are like your Camp Sakani or your High Bridge or your Manitou. They're going to be big. They're going to be 80-plus acres. They're going to have extra parts and pieces to them that we don't have in other facilities. They're all special. So Camp Sakani is very wild, very natural, where Manitou is very developed into a, a, a botanical garden. So they can be a lot of different things, but they're bringing someone from a regional basis. And then we have this natural lands, which is sort of this vague description, but really it's, it's parks at, that are meant to be open and natural and largely undeveloped. And the function of them is to serve the population of, by being undeveloped by allowing space for nature to exist, by allowing space for folks to go walk in the natural wild within our communities. So Indian Canyon Park is a great example here. Um, High Drive Bluff is another great example here as well. Um, so where do we go from here when it talks about natural and conservation? And how do those things mix together? I think that's a really important thing for us to think about. And when we look at, at least as how we define it in the city, Natural and conservation lands are both the same in that they're both land in a natural state. So that makes it kind of confusing. The difference is how you restrict what can happen in those spaces. So while a natural piece of property would be development, where future, future development per our uh, written descriptions could potentially be allowed, it's not planned. Right? So they're reserved for natural. We're not planning to build anything on them, but there's nothing that says you couldn't where on a conservation piece of property, you have a restriction that says you can't build these things here. 
And so that's one of the big distinctions there. Um, in natural lands, we don't restrict the type of recreation that can occur there. I mean, we don't have a ball field, so there's usually not somebody playing you know, with a soccer ball. But you could, I suppose, if you really wanted to, try and play Frisbee on the side of the high drive bluff and see how it goes. <laughs> Um, where on a conservation a piece of property, you, you're restricting that recreation a little bit more. Um, so the difference there too is that while on our natural lands, we might allow some infrastructure on those locations. So we did consider a proposal while we didn't accept it at Hamlin Park. If that had a conservation restriction on that property, we wouldn't be considering that proposal. And so depending, like a Beacon Hill is another great example where a Vista has a major transmission line coming through the middle of a natural land and it's just part of the natural land. You know, I mean, we don't want the power lines there necessarily, but we have access through the land beneath them, and so it kind of works. It allows us to have contiguous space. Where on conservation property, you know, most improvements are gonna be restricted, and that's gonna be enforceable by a third party. So we'll talk about how do we enforce that here now. Um, first, I think, you know this, I don't want to lecture you, but uh, certainly the authority you have today, when we think about the city of Spokane and the park system, one of the big checks and balances is you. It's the park board. You have the authority to broadly cover what gets built and where when it comes to park lands. Of course, the charter protects all of our parks from being sold or transferred. That cannot happen, not even from the park board, not even from the city council. It has to be a vote of the public. I don't think that's ever happened. That's an incredibly powerful thing to protect parks as parks. You then, the board, have broad authority over what those parks get used for. Um, you have the power to say what gets improved and where or what doesn't get improved and where, and you do have exclusive authority over, over what those improvements are. Um, the improvements then in any given park are really sort of generally guided by our classifications, but our classifications are not written in the SMC, they are not written in the comprehensive plan, and so they are really a guideline that we are providing to you and to us as staff to help us generally guide how things work, but at the end of the day, if the park board says no or yes to something, that's what we do as staff. And so that's how it works today. So if we wanted to add additional protections, specific to conservation. So let's say we wanted to take Lincoln Park, Upper Lincoln Park, and preserve that as a conservation uh, piece of property, specifically in perpetuity. We would probably be looking at recording a, uh, a conservation covenant to that piece of property. There are some legal, there are some specific legal requirements for how that works. If that's done, and we do this now with conservation futures, um, you restrict land for conservation purposes in exchange, like with conservation futures, the county buys us the land, they give us the land at no cost to us, and in exchange for that, they restrict how we can use that land forever. They say on there, it needs to be dedicated for conservation. You can't do any sort of these sorts of things, and I'll go through what those things are. And so that exchange of the property from a private party or the county to the city is how that transaction happens. So it really does require a third party in a lot of cases to record that sort of a covenant. What are the restrictions when that happens? You can't subdivide or change that piece of property. You can't build anything, you know, residential, commercial, or industrial. You can't really build anything, including communication towers. Um, you, know, you might be able to build a trailhead to give people access, but that's about it. Um, there's no filling, excavating, grading, mining. We don't generally mine our properties, but you can't do that, and that's written in there. We can't record easements for either access or utilities. So we don't want people digging through these spaces. There's no motor vehicles usually, except for the rare instance of our crews having to get out there to maintain something occasionally. No advertising, no billboards, and no off-leash dog walking would be a part of that. So that's how our existing conservation futures properties are governed today. And they are parts and pieces within our master plan, or within our natural lands. They're not all of them, but anything bought through conservation futures is gonna be subject to these sorts of restrictions. What is allowed? Natural trail walking, absolutely. Tree harvesting, uh, livestock grading, ecological restoration, and on-leash dog walking like our other parks are all gonna be allowed uses in a space that is um, protected with a conservation <laughs> covenant. So here's the rub. If we wanted to add a conservation covenant for say Lincoln Park, the existing conservation, <clears throat> these restrictions are largely symbolic. 
And the reason we say this is that this park board, without selling that land to somebody else or selling interest in that land to somebody else, doesn't have an enforceable covenant. You can re record a symbolic covenant, and a future park board could then come and say, we want to get rid of that covenant. And that would add an extra step of protection for them having to take that measure in the future. So you could do that. And if you wanted to have a legally binding covenant that can't be removed without you know, extraordinary measures, the park board would need to convey some sort of a conservation interest to another group in that property. And so let's say there was a private nonprofit that was interested in protecting Lincoln Heights, or excuse me, Lincoln Park. We would have to, as a park board, sell them an interest in a conservation easement in that property for some sort of compensation. And then that third party would be able to, that transaction would allow us to permanently restrict that land. So to create that enforceable restrictive covenant, we would need to grant that third party authority to restrict that land. Um, so in that case, if the park board did do that, the city would enforce any restrictions on that property and the third party then would have right to bring legal action against the park board if you weren't enforcing that. So that adds a little bit of a, an extra dynamic to your properties, but that's how you would protect those, those lands. So future question alert. <laughs> do we want to do that? That's my question for you. That's really the question at the end of this. So start thinking about that. Don't, an don't answer yet. So <laughs> while that's the big question at hand, and I know I'm kind of waxing poetic here, but th while that's the big question at hand, one of the things we as staff have been thinking about is how do we better provide information to you as a board to help reassure that our proposals that we're bringing to you are consistent with what the public has asked us to do in our parks. And so that's really what we're thinking is what can we do better to provide information to make decisions? And we're relying on that matrix that came from our master plan of what are our needs, where are the projects, what are the conditions, and what are our opportunities? So we have some thoughts. So this is also thoughts for your consideration. One thought would be on your briefing paper, very simply, we'd like to add a master plan goal objective strategy section to all of your briefing papers. And that way it forces us as staff to write, to actually read the master plan and look at what is the goal <laughs> objective strategy, write it down and then you can see that. And then you can also see the project tier. Is it a first tier thing, a second tier thing, a third tier priority or nothing, not a, not a priority. And so that is a really easy way I think to look at one sheet of paper and say, is this consistent with what we should be doing? So one thought there. Um, what would that look like on a dog park item? We presented that a little bit today. Um, goal B, objective one, priority tier first. For high profile actions, we'd recommend doing what we did again today with the, with the dog park, which is we wanna bring uh, a discussion item to the board and have the whole board hear it, let the public know, let them provide comment to you, and then we can come back the next month or two months or three months later to, to ask for action, and that would be a way to allow the public to comment in an open forum and hear your concerns in an open forum too. So that's another option if you were interested in that. Third, we're thinking about this idea of a park property development assessment form. We do, if you remember, and Nick probably remembers the development of the park acquisition questionnaire. Are we, are, should we be acquiring this property? Have you thought about this, staff? So we're thinking about something similar to that, which would be maybe a one or two page form, which is a high level evaluation of the impacts and outcomes to any development action on a piece of property. And it may not be limited to natural lands, right? It could also apply to some of our developed properties. Like, are you displacing another use? Does this activity or action, you know, is this land meant for this or was it meant for something else? Um, we're worried that, you know, natural lands like Meadow Glen that sit natural today, which were bought for development, you know, we want to make sure, are we developing something that was intended to be developed or are you developing something that was intended to be natural? And so a checklist would be, provide us a way to, to review that. Um, does this have the support of the community? You know, how have you touched with the community? So some check boxes there. So we're thinking about a form where we could record this. This would be a little bit of work for us to do before we develop it. We kind of want to know if that would help your decisions. But this is something we're thinking about providing. We would like to keep it short so that you could flip through and you're not like 80 pages into some document. It's not a big impact statement. It's really just a short form. Let's look at this quickly. 
Um, and then we like to recommend public comment be included with the agenda items that they're commenting on, much as okay. city council does. Keep open forum. You can come in and talk about anything, but then if you have a specific item, let's lump it together so it's all in context with each other. I think that helps everybody. Mm -hmm. So those are the, the changes that we're thinking about. Um, you know, one of the other things that didn't make it onto this list, but that we're going to provide to you anyways, is just a map of where our conservation protected properties are. Conservation Futures provides that to us, so we do, we can show you, you know, where we have properties that were bought with Conservation Futures, and certainly on a, on a development checklist, we would see, oh, is this already protected? Is there, is there a deed restriction or some sort of restriction against this? If there is, you're not doing that. And so that would be an easy checklist to, to add on there as well. So, those are the two big questions. Not to put you all on the spot, you don't all have to answer right now, but this is something we're thinking about before moving forward. We'd really like to understand, you know, are there desires for additional protections above and beyond what you have today? And are any of our thoughts, do they, do they resonate with you? Nick, before we go to questions, I would just like to thank you on behalf of the board yes. for the efforts you put into this. Sure. They were considerable. I know from the retreat we developed questions, random comments, and just kind of threw them all at you and said, make something out of this. <laughs> You've done a heck of a job. Thank you again. Sure. So let's go with any, any of the comments Nick has. Questions? Christina, go ahead and start. Yeah, so um, in regard to natural lands versus conservation, if we were to make a decision to go with a, to turn a piece of property to conservation, if there are existing structures that do not meet that criteria, for example, a paved path, does that have to be removed or is it grandfathered in? I suppose that would be at the discretion of the board. You know, we'd want to be consistent with how we look at this. I think you bring up a great question, and, and I have a question for your question, um, <laughs> which is do we do this across the board to all of our natural lands or do we pick and choose which ones we want to do it or do we do it in response to public outcry? And to me, there needs to be some real strategic thinking in how we develop what to protect and where and how. And so my suggestion to you would be that if this was of desire to the board, then we would have to form a project as our park planning group and really probably form a work group and really strategically think about over the course of a period of time, not unlike our dog park, let's put a project on the books to figure this out. Um, we don't want to make a knee-jerk reaction. So what do you do in those cases? I don't know yet. Um, I think that would have to be determined through a process. Okay. One other point I'd bring up that's kind of similar for us to note is do we subdivide a park? So Lincoln's a great example of the lower Lincoln already has structures, playgrounds. Upper Lincoln is more of that natural conservation. So are you going to subdivide a park or are you going to consider it in its entirety? You certainly could. You certainly could do that. I, I believe Lincoln's probably already parceled into a number of parcels anyways, but you could take any par uh, parcel and subdivide it prior to conservation. You can't afterwards, right. but you could, you could prior to. Okay. You think about Palisades as a great example where a lot of Palisades is just natural land, but what we acquired recently this last year in Rimrock to Riverside, that's conservation. And that's only really a, a, par a part or piece of Palisades. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think your briefing paper ideas are great, Nick. Um, not only for us, but for the public, because it lets the public know that we're checking the boxes, that it provides us that information at our fingertips so that when the public has concerns, you know, have you checked for a wildlife corridor? We can say, yes. <laughs> so I think that um, it's very reassuring. I don't know. Other questions? I don't have Please a question, do. but I have a comment. Um, I'll just dive into the big one. Um, the, the hurdle I'm having is that a uh, park designation offers so much protection as it is. And I'm concerned about protecting parks from, from park uses, especially for future uses that we may not even conceive of at this point. So it, it's not a question, it's just a comment. That's the hurdle I'm having. I, I just don't know that additional protections there's not huge development pressure. I mean, this, this is basically triggered by one specific instance. And as we've heard from other neighborhoods, they're interested in conserving their properties as well. I'm afraid if we start doing this, it's going to be very hard to say yes to you and no to you. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't know. That's the hurdle I'm having. Nick? I, I think we would have to, in what you're saying, I think we would have to require some sort of justification to be 
presented as to why we would make the change. And it would have to be pretty well thought out and documented because, like you said, you don't want to shoot yourself in the foot, basically, by making a change to something that five years from now we're like, oh, man. <laughs> so I would want to make sure that with any process that, that there is a lot of uh, very thoughtful understanding of why this is, is being requested. I don't know that the board ultimately wants to request that we do this. It's got to come from, I think, would think from outside, outside, right? But we want to make sure that if somebody's coming to us with this thought or if the Parks Department is coming to us, that there's a well-justified reason for it, outlining the pros and the cons, and, and ultimately what we'd be gaining or losing by doing that. Any other comments? This is to me. Hmm? Did you? I have some comments and did somebody else? Whoever, have jump in please. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was just gonna say, when I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I can <laughs> say. right out of the station. <laughs> I can make mine and then yours will come back. Okay. Um, regarding the first one, you know, at this point, I don't know, but I, I do want to make it, <clears throat> at least in my opinion as a park board member, just because a park is not programmed or developed doesn't mean it's not used. And we definitely need to recognize that, um, whether it's in a deed or not. Um, and then as a, with regard to the second item, I. We put in a big effort in that master plan and we gathered information from um, all the citizens and in many different ways, online and in person, and that's what we have to hang our hats on for making decisions for the next five years or until we do another one. So I think it's very important to have our briefing papers just in case we don't have time to go back and reread the entire master plan every time something comes up, I think it's very important to have our briefing papers um, refer back to the master plan, maybe even what chapter, um, just to, so we don't forget that the master plan really is the voice of the citizens mm -hmm. as best as we have it. Thanks. Jennifer, did your memory come I, back? I did, yes, <laughs> it came back. Um, I. I would want us to avoid creating a blanket conservation policy because each neighborhood and each park are different and they need to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the needs of the citizens in that area and the wishes. Um, so I think doing this on a case-by-case -case basis is really important to maintain. I think for myself a point that I'm still not clear of and may not be I know the master plan, it's often mentioned how the community wanted us to preserve our natural lands. Does that mean restrict usage of those natural lands? Well, I don't know if that can be answered, but again, that's right now, I've, and I don't know, but responding, when they're responding to that, are they responding to that in the current condition of the parks? Like Park X is this is what I do in that park. Would that person that says preserve it be in favor of saying you could no longer do that in that park because we're restricting that usage? I don't know, but those are things I do believe we need to consider. And again, on a case-by-case -case basis, I would certainly not want to ever see a, a blanket proposal that says let's make them all conservation areas or let's put some deed restriction on all of them. I, hopefully we never get to that, and if we do, I hope the next park board takes it away. <laughs> Any other comments, thoughts? Well, I might be wrong, but we're looking at also one of the questions is, I think the format that you use today, how this came back, presented, input, time for us to process, uh, I thought that was very helpful. Uh, I think it also is helpful in a manner for you as a staff because it gives you more time. I'm not that you need, you know, lots of time, but there's no, there doesn't seem to be as much of a knee-jerk reaction. And I know that's coined statement, but it allows us, I think, to um, 
you know, most of us have done all the reading and what have you, but we need to come to this very open as to what we might hear new, and then how do we take that, which you've given us now, time to digest, and then we can come back. So uh, this process, you know, I, I find very helpful. All right, if, thank you, Nick. You're welcome, thank we you will, for the discussion. We will move to public comments. Thank you, Nick. Good job, Nick, thank you. <laughs> All right, I do have a, another group of visitor sign-in cards for this particular discussion. So we will start, and if you, we could try to limit it again to two minutes, I certainly would appreciate it. Um, the very first, per, or the first person would be Mike Peterson. So Mike, if you would come and speak on this. Sorry, Mike, I'm getting out of your way. <laughs> Just making sure so they can see. Hi, I'm Mike Peterson. Thanks for letting me speak about this. I'm uh, part of a new group, Spokane Urban Neighborhood Nature, that uh, is concerned about natural areas, but is concerned also about um, our river and, and protecting the values that we have. I personally am part of Spokane Ponderosa and we're doing a lot of restoration, some on these natural areas. We're going to plant uh, Campion Park here next week actually. And we just put 2,200 trees into Camp Sakani, which I don't think is an official natural area, but I, I believe it could qualify. And so part of my quick thoughts are, maybe there needs to be an assessment of the current natural lands. Um, kind of see what shape they're in. I know some of them need some restoration. Some probably don't have extremely rare, they have rare plants as such and probably need to be really careful around those. So I appreciate Nick had some options about um, how to protect them in a different conservation way. I think there's even additional options to that that I've been discussing with some folks. And so finally, I, I think maybe, I don't know, maybe there needs to be a natural land committee and People like me would be happy to be part of that and some of you folks. And so we kind of explore this before we jump too far one way or the other. Because I really do believe it's important to restore some of these lands, but also some of them are in great shape and protect them as they are. So thank you. Thank Thanks. you, Mike. Julia Goltz. Okay, thank you, Julia. Thank you for being here. Karen Mobley. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me back. Um, I just had a couple of things to say. Um, one, um, Spokane Urban Nature, of which I am the sort of ad hoc impromptu leader because I'm the person with the Zoom subscription, um, <laughs> would really like to um, reiterate what we have said over the last few months, which is we would really like to make good on the promise that we come up with some preservation designation for Lincoln and Underhill. Um, we've spent independently with a bunch of the people who are involved in our group researching not only the things that Nick presented but other alternatives within Washington state law of things that might be useful tools for this purpose. And I would like to volunteer and I believe some of my neighbors and colleagues would be willing to volunteer to be on some kind of a work group to really explore how that might happen. Because I don't think it's an either or situation for you. I think there are actually alternatives that are greater and beyond that. I also think we have the potential for having some really constructive nonprofit partners who are involved with the conservation um, designation in other areas of Spokane County and Eastern Washington. Um, the second thing I want to say is, boy, were you guys effective at getting me to meet all of my neighbors. And um, <laughs> I have been connecting with the Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council and a lot of the people in our neighborhood. And the Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council passed a resolution, which you probably know, that they want to preserve the natural properties at Underhill and at Lincoln. But now we're concocting a plan, which is we're going to have a nature day at Lincoln Park with the intent of providing some community education around the very specific plants that are unique to this ecosystem 
and to have some bird watching and bird identification activities. And so we haven't got it all figured out. We're still rousting up some volunteers for that purpose, but we're planning on having this happen on Saturday, May 13th. We're not planning to serve any food or have any firearms or anything that require us to have a special events permit, but we are going to set up a tent and hand out information about the birds and the plants. We're gonna do some trash collection and we're hoping to round up some of our Audubon neighbors and other friends to take groups of people out. So you'll hear back from me. I talked to Fianna, she's willing to help us promote it. And if we're really lucky, we might end up with some kind of Friends of Lincoln Park group that does other things. Um, we are not gonna have Christmas lights, we're not gonna have an art fair, but I think we're gonna really stay pretty focused, at least at the beginning, around the environmental education about what's on the South Hill and why it's important to us. Um, anyway, so I'm volunteering if you want somebody to help you, and I appreciate your patience with all of us because I think that this is really important to the neighborhood and we really appreciate your taking time to listen to us. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Oops. Sheila Evans. Hi, thanks for having me back. Um, first of all, I don't have too much to add to what she just said, but I do want to thank you all for listening to our concerns about Lincoln and Underhill as potential locations for the dog park and really listening to the fact that those, those areas, those untouched areas are important to a whole other group of users which would have been excluded. And, and to you know, hearing our concerns about the accessibility of untouched natural areas to neighborhoods. And so we really appreciate that. Nick, thank you so much for your work on all of this. Um, what I wanted to say was that you know, I definitely support the idea of having Upper Lincoln and the, the portion of Underhill that we've been talking about designated as conservation. I was looking at the list of, of uh, requirements for that and did not see anything that conflicted with the current use of it. You know, we've already got a leash law there, we've already got, you know, there's nothing being built and, and it wouldn't change anything for the current users of the park to do that. So I would like to request, you know, however we do that, that, that please consider going forward with those protections for those parks. Thanks. Thank you, Sheila. Hal Roll. Thank you for having me and us today, and um, I appreciate all the work that Nick and his crew have done. Um, I'm looking into this, I um, feel like we weren't abandoned, and um, we were paid attention to. Um, I'm a registered nurse, I've worked 30 years in mental health, and um, natural wild areas are really important for mental health. There's a field developing called eco-psychology, I don't know how many of you have heard of it. And it looks like, what's the effect of the environment on human psychology? And I just want to read something really quick. This is from a Yale group. And um, there's been over a thousand studies looking at like what the effects, how people benefit from nature and um, wild spaces. And they've said that the studies show time in nature, as long as people feel safe, is an antidote for stress, can lower blood pressure, hormone levels, reduce nervous system arousal, enhance immune system function, increase self-esteem, reduce anxiety, and improve, improve mood. Attention deficit disorder and aggression lessen in natural environments, which also helps speed the rate of healing. Um, in a recent study, psych unit researchers found that being in nature reduced feelings of isolation promoted calm, and lifted mood among patients. So professionally, that's something I've tried to bring into my work. I was telling people, hey, get out. You know, I, I worked at Frontier, and I go, are you getting your kids out? Here you can go. And I think having some wild places, I love Manitou, but having some places where people can see animals in a somewhat wild habitat, but in the urban area, is invaluable and I also think we need some designation because unless we have that designation we're going to keep back going back and back because further on something else is going to develop I mean who knew that there were going to be 
motor-powered bicycles 30 years ago, or uh, you know that the dog parks had increased and all these uses. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Hal. Sam Mace. Thank you for letting me uh, speak to you all again. And uh, I'm not going to repeat, I think, what has already been said. Uh, but so I live right across, you guys know this, I've been here before, but I live right across from Underhill Park. And it's a tough neighborhood. Um, this last week we had both a fire in the park and we also had a drive-by shooting a block and a half from my front door um, on the basketball court. And, and you know, I never thought that I would live in a neighborhood quite as challenging as that. And I've also um, really fallen in love with it, although the development is probably going to push us out. We you know we just lost a quarter of our tree canopy adjacent to the park. Um, but what has made it and what so many people just come together on is our little natural area. Is it as big and incredible as Lincoln Park? No, that is amazing. And I really hope that that area is protected. But I also hope that our little area in Underhill, especially since we've lost acres on the other side, is given some level of protection where it's a place that the kids can play, where a lot of us were driven off the Ben Burr Trail now that it's all EP out bikes and older people no longer feel comfortable walking up there. And now people now walk in that area of Underhill with the dirt paths and everything. And, and I just really want to see, you know, we had 65, 70 people come out to a meeting at Liberty Park and ask for that area not to be developed and frankly would have been destroyed of all its values uh, of how people use it right now. And I just really hope and urge folks to honor that and help us figure out the right language or how that moves forward. And for us, it's not just we don't like have the camas down there that Lincoln Park has, but we have balsam root and we've got desert parsley and we have these things that the kids love. And I think it's their only, it's their only natural area to go. They don't get driven to Riverside Park, right? This is what we have. And for us to move forward as a livable neighborhood down there, especially with the North-South Freeway coming in, it's so critical. Because Liberty Park doesn't have that. All we have is Underhill. And I just want to thank Nick and um, Garrett and others for listening to and responding to what the neighbors had to say. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Is there anyone online that uh, would want to make a comment regarding this? Again, I can't see names, or if you do, speak up. All right. And then I have one. And then uh, Garrett has uh, one email to read. I do. I have one from uh, Carol Tomzik that was submitted, and she was uh, sorry that she wasn't able to uh, make it here today. And she is the chair of the Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council. And so I'll just read this quick note from Carol. Uh, I wanted to remind you prior to the park board meeting that the Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Co Council passed a resolution on November 15th of 2022 in support of designating Upper Lincoln Park as a park natural land. I greatly appreciate your work and time on park classifications. The preservation of our natural habitats in our neighborhood parks is very important to our council and residents. I also wanted to state that many of our residents walk their dogs in up li Upper Lincoln Park our council does not want our residents to lose their recreational access to Upper Lincoln Park or any other neighborhood park with the potential options for, for natural land designations. Okay. So thank you everyone for your comments. Um, everyone, was, again, very respectful night or respectful day, whatever it is. <laughs> thank you all. We're getting to be a night. Yeah. Who knows where we're extending out, but I, I do appreciate what everyone had to say today. I appreciate Nick's presentations and the fact that we all took the time to listen, ask questions, and make comments. It, it shows a very uh, professional approach by everyone, so thank you. So we will move on to committee reports then. Wow. And, uh, Regarding the committee reports that we have, when you get ready to say where your next meeting is, 
you might want to check that they've all changed. <laughs> they've all. That'll be a part of my director's report oh. to check your email. So anyway, check your emails. It's like we're. So this we one seem has, to be migrating to libraries. This one is not current. Or the dates and have. times are going to be yeah. consistent, but the location yeah. will change. But anyway, what was on the agenda has changed. So oh. let's start out with uh, Kevin. You would be the first one. Yes, the April meeting was canceled, but the next meeting will be at the Liberty Park Library events room on May 2nd at 415, and we'll also be doing WebEx. All right, thank you, Kevin. Land Committee, Greta? And I believe uh, you, you have an action item or two? Yes, uh, we met on April 5th, and we had several action items, um, a couple of which were on the consent agenda. But we had one action item that we all decided to bring to the full board. Um, it is All Play Systems LLC contract for play equipment, servicing, and installation at Wild Horse Park Playground. And um, one of the reasons we decided to bring it is I had never heard of Wild Horse Park. Um, it's, <laughs> it's a very small park, and we'll learn about it here. And. Um, <coughs> also wanted to point out, and Barry will probably point it out, that City Council has provided us quite a bit of money, I think over a million dollars, um, that they received from the federal government for us to put into renovation of uh, parks. And we are working on some playgrounds, several playgrounds around town, and Wild Horse is one of those. And Barry can give us the details. Well, thank you, Greta. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, Wild Horse Park... Uh, it is about three and a half acres, and it's, let me, let me show you on the map here. Um, first of all, though, I'm hoping that this comes up over here so you can see. We mm -hmm. have numerous parks where land is rather um, tough to get at times for uh, everyday citizens, uh, recreation opportunities, play equipment, that sort of thing. So s several of our parks are uh, slated for improvement. And mostly playground improvements, and to get kids out and into some some action. Um, I don't. I, my eyesight's not too good for this particular screen, but you should be seeing up there like B. A. Clark Park, uh, Harmon, Wild Horse, uh, Parkwater, Liberty Park, Grant Park, uh, Dutch Jake's Park. These are uh, pretty dense neighborhoods. Today, I'd like to talk to you about. Um, uh, about Wild Horse, and there was an action item too for Liberty Park as well. Um, and it's part of the city council uh, that they they relayed about 1.1 million, as Greta said, uh, to parks to develop playgrounds, which is what we're doing with that money, of course. Um, so this month, I'm going to bring to you uh, this park and 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 Liberty, and next month you'll probably see another, and the next month after that, I'll probably be here again. Uh, whether or not it gets on action, uh, I mean, comes to the full board here, uh, but it was probably, you know, it's going to be there somewhere uh, on your consent or or, or other. Um, Wild Horse Park, though, is located up by Esmeralda mm -hmm. Golf Course, and it's going to be sandwiched between Esmeralda and. Um, and, and downtown um, Hilliard by, by the North-South Freeway. But what comes with that North-South Freeway is a trail system, and it's called the Children of the Sun Trail. Oh. And oh. one of the main stops on that trail is right at Liberty Park. Um, this is a little bit more zoomed in of Liberty Park. It's kind of a triangle shaped. It's in a little neighborhood. Um, lots of kids running around. Is this Wild Horse Park? Wild Horse I'm sorry, what did I say? Yeah. Liberty. Yeah. I know you've been li living Liberty for a while. You're fine. Excuse me. Yeah. We're Wild with you. Horse. It's like... You know what you were saying. Thank you so much. Oh, it's almost uh, 5.30. My it's like... We've got so many contracts going right now, too. I often get my contractors mixed up, so thanks for correcting me. Um, so on the uh, on the west side of our project is going to be this trail and the, and the and the highway eventually, and and on the north side of our project is a, a vacated um, well I shouldn't say vacated it's going to be a a, a walkway and and part of a cul-de-sac there um, on Garland, and there will be a flyover or a um, um, a pedestrian pathway that goes across the highway to downtown. Um, Hilliard. And so kids are moving through this park and through that over that overpass to get to school 
and people are going downtown and back, and, there, and so there's a lot of movement through this particular park. And so as we got to looking at it um, in, in the office when we started putting uh, pencil to paper, we started seeing a lot of pathways start to emerge as people getting from point A to point B. And what it did is we started to see this emergence of a center kind of piece where, where a, a beautiful playground could be developed, like in, you know, as an overall master plan, even um, uh, sport courts and whatnot, as the community desires over the next however many years um, indefinitely. Um, but of course, we don't have that much money. This is about a playground, not a redevelopment of the whole park. So uh, as we went through, we, we decided, you know, let's. This is a neighborhood park, and according to the master plan, which Nick talked about earlier, it warrants a 3,000 plus or minus square foot playground. And with that, some wonderful play equipment. And so I started looking at play equipment and working with vendors. And uh, <laughs> this little guy, it looks like he's stretched out to the side a little bit. That's probably the screen. He's not quite that stretchy. Uh, but they love swings, and we went to the neighborhood council, and they, and they loved everything that we had to offer them, and they said, you know, we love the tree house. Mm -hmm. We want the tree house, and we want some other, you know, things for the kids to get in and play around, and, and we want it to be for, for children that are a little bit older, you know, a little bit on the older side, not so much the tots, but the, <laughs> the elementary school kids that are running back and forth to, to their schools and whatnot, and they're going to wind up here at this particular park. Here's another shot of some of that play equipment. Remember, the play equipment is being funded um, by ARPA funds. That's the American Rescue Plan Act, and council sent over the funds for those. So um, this contract is all about that playground, and I'll be coming back to you with another contract to do the, the walkways and the landscaping. Mm -hmm. We want to get this one before you and hopefully approved so that we can get that play equipment manufactured while we do the other work. It takes a long time. Anyway, here's a bigger picture of the, of the area. And um, it might look a little bit um, stretchy, like the little <laughs> fella before. It's really a lot more condensed than this. And it's going to be a real fantastic, fun little park. And, and with that, um, we got um, uh, proposals on a state contract, which means that they're negotiated down to about the lowest you can get in price. Still expensive stuff. Um, for the play equipment and the installation of that play equipment along with the, the surfacing, which is a spongy kind of material. Uh, it's very natural looking though. It's called engineered wood fiber. It's a lot more friendly than it sounds. Um, <laughs> and with that, I just want to ask um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to, happy to answer them, but also I would love if you would um, be willing to approve um, this contract to all play systems um, for installation and equipment at Wild Horse Park in the amount of $130,694.59, and that's with tax. That's turnkey. So moved. Oh. Oh, you didn't oh, need a motion. I, oh, I probably needed a motion. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought very good oh, idea. I'm sorry. What you said. What you said. <laughs> I'm really taking a step right, in there. Right, right, right. I, I don't want to be a chair of any committee. I will move that we approve the All Play Systems LLC contract for play equipment surfacing and installation at Wild Horse Park for the Wild Horse Park Playground Project in the amount of $130,694.59 uh, tax inclusive. I wonder if we have anybody that would second that part. I wonder. <laughs> I would love to second. All right. Uh, moved and seconded. Any further discussion? I'll go ahead and call for the question then. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Thanks, Barry. It Thank you so much. unanimously, and um, good luck with Thanks that some. little tiny master plan you did for Wild Horse Park. <laughs> Thanks, Barry. <laughs> Thank you, Love Barry. your pictures. <laughs> um, the next land committee meeting will be 3.30 p.m. on May 3rd in the Liberty Park Library events room at 402 South Pittsburgh Street, and also virtually via WebEx. Thank you, Greta. Um, the rec committee was canceled. Sally's not here today. She uh, is excused. Anyway, she said she would not be able to make it. So I will at least go with the rec committee's next meeting is May 3rd, 5.15 p.m. in the Liberty Park Library events room. 
and it'll also be virtually via WebEx. So you get a two for one, land and rec. There you go. Same trip. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and let's move then to uh, Jerry and Riverfront Park. Yes, we do have a couple of action items. We had a, a variety of uh, work that we accomplished and many of it was through your consent agenda. So check that if you're not sure what everything is. And Mr. Hammond is going to help us with this. And we have been waiting for this and that's why I asked him to present it. Happens to be the bridge that we have all been waiting to see finished. Take a Thanks, deep Jerry. breath because here it comes. I'm lost, but I can. I think I could probably do this without the presentation too. Oh, there's a bridge the in Riverfront Park. I'm not sure if you guys are <laughs> aware of that. Yeah, we have bridges. So <laughs> moved. Uh, How there, many? <laughs> there's 13 of them. And what condition are they in? No. Parks and Rec and Bridges Department. Is that what we are? That's what it feels we, like. <laughs> after this one, we're going to back coming back to parks. Nice. Um, so, oh. <laughs> in in Riverfront Park, we have this, the two suspension bridges, and, and there's the North Suspension Bridge, of course, we fixed uh, two years ago, and then we had the Don Cardong Bridge, of course, we fixed last year. And now we're on to the South Suspension Bridge, which has been closed since about this time, almost a year ago, May of 2022. Two. May of 20, what year is it, right? Um, and so you can see that bridge here, South Bridge. If you remember in the Riverfront Park Master Plan that bridges and uh, remaining bridge improvements was, was a master plan project that was the top tier of things that didn't get funded by the bond. And so we didn't have money for it, but we knew we needed to do it, and so that's why we've been doing it. Um, this is our last of the major bridge renovations in Riverfront Park. This will be our fifth, our fifth since the start of the bond. Mm. So pretty impressive. Um, we did get a grant from the state for $1.4 million for this. We actually get our contract next week. I just heard that today, so that's fantastic that's news. Um, and city council allocated about $1.4 million in REIT funds to offset the match that we would have to pay. So that's a fantastic budget of about $2.8 million. This completely replaces the deck of that bridge. The, the guardrails of that bridge are historic, so they get renovated in a historic way. They get taken off, modified, put back on. The historic piece actually stays the same, and then we add another rail that looks a little bit different in between those pieces so your little ones don't fall through the rails of the bridge, and we meet the modern uh, restrictions for guardrails. But that's a, a pretty cool amenity to keep historically. And then the, the handrail, which was originally wood and really cool, which falls apart, and then and gets replaced with a crappy piece of Trex decking or whatever we use, gets replaced with a, a stainless steel handrail. So it'll, it'll look like the North Suspension Bridge when we're done. It's 50 years old almost. We're looking to punch 50 more years of life into this bridge. The big steel components and the towers all get a stay. They're in pretty good shape. Um, we got bids, and for the first time in, I think, three years, we had a bid come in under our budget, which oh. was fantastic. Um, so I don't know if that's a sign of us you know, in increasing the size <laughs> of our budgets or the contractor's pricing actually stabilizing a little bit, but uh, the, the low bid price here was two point, just under $2.1 million, and our anticipated cost was 2.3. So that's a, that's a fantastic uh, number there. And really, that was Garco Construction. Uh, the second place bidder was also under our budget, but Garco's well qualified. They built the North Suspension Bridge, so they, they have a good means and methods and familiarity with what we need to do here. And I'd just like to point out, it's really all about that. Mm -hmm. It's about the falls. And we're missing out on that right now. You should see how many people walk down there and get to the end of the bridge and turn around. And they're like, oh, that's kind of a bummer. I can't see the falls. So to have that back is what this is all about. We're asking for your approval of that today, and we'll go forth in earnest to, to build the bridge. I'm glad those pictures came up. Thanks, Nick. So with that, um, I will state the motion uh, to approve Garco Construction Incorporated South Suspension Bridge Renovation Construction Contract for $2,099,949.90 and tax inclusive. I'll Call second. <laughs> I'll second. No, I'm gonna Thank you. All right. We have a second from Nick. Sumner. Uh, with that, we'll then call for the question. All in favor of the passage? Aye. 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 Moved and passed. Thank you. All right. With the next one we brought in, and John is all ready to go. <laughs> I think he's been ready all day, but. <laughs> 
Anyway, uh, some things that are happening uh, that I had put on here because this one has to do with kind of a show and tell because I don't think maybe some of you have even ridden the Sky Ride. I don't know for sure. But anyway, this gives you an idea of what oh. we in Parks and Rec and Riverfront have to do to keep this thing running. With that, John. Thank you, Jerry. And if you haven't had a ride on the Sky Ride, I will give you a personal tour. So please look me up and I'll give you a ride. <laughs> right. And it's a great time right now. The falls are great, so please come down and check it out. Um, but uh, Sky Ride takes a lot of work. Uh, a lot of work, and so, um, and we always come back. Hey, we're doing maintenance. We're doing annual maintenance, uh, and I we want to take a little bit of a deeper dive to say wh what exactly this is. Uh, this contract before you is really straightforward. We're adding more money to the contract to get the completed work done, and I'm going to go into why. So a little bit of background. In 2017, we started building the Skate Ribbon and Sky Ride. It was the first bond project. Really excited about that. We took the opportunity because of the site work um, to do $200,000 worth of uh, preventative maintenance work and to catch up on some past uh, preventative maintenance work that we needed to catch up on. And so during that time, um, we... Uh, Maintenance falls in a couple categories when it comes to preventative maintenance. There Usually there's a periodicity behind it. Usually it's like five years, six years, ten years, so forth. Uh, and so in the past, we weren't as good as on the maintenance as we should have been. We kind of postponed things. Uh, but we've been trying to get on a more routine schedule and predictive schedule. And this is what we're going to talk about. So in 2021, following the work in 2017, we came to Park Board and asked for a sole source with Doppelmeyer USA, who is the manufacturer of the Skyride. And so uh, a lot of that because they provide specialized parts and service, we approved the, the sole source. Uh, we came back a month later uh, with a master agreement for parts and service, uh, and that was put at $50,000, or $500,000, and the reason, or excuse me, $50,000, <laughs> and the reason we did that is for annual parts and service. We didn't want to have to do a competitive bid process every time we bought a shiv from Doppelmeyer, uh, and so we, we put that together, and that's been really helpful, uh, but as we went forward, so we started looking at, we're five years now past when we did the work in 2017. And sure enough, those periodicity checks start coming back. And those are bigger checks. When you start talking, the years go on, those are bigger checks, they're more expensive checks. Uh, and we have started figuring out, well, how do we not make this an emergency every time we have to do a, a standard preventative maintenance check? Uh, so uh, we asked Oppenmeyer to provide us a three-year maintenance audit assessment inspection of the Skyride to give us what we need to do to be able to establish a more routine and preventative maintenance schedule. And so they did that, and they completed that uh, back here recently in September. Uh, and so part of that three-year plan was gave us a list of work that, we're gonna, that we need to do, and here it is. Um, and so I'm not going to go over line by line. It's really, it's really in detail. But I want to point out some of the pretty pictures. So a lot of, I say shiv, I say hanger, I say cable. What does that all mean? Um, so in the in the picture here, the big wheel is called a shiv. It's basically a an aluminum wheel with a rubber gasket around it. Then that goes into a shiv assembly, which you see there in the lower picture. And then the hanger is what sits on top of the gondola, and it hangs on the what's called a rope, not a cable. Uh, so that's uh, Doppelmeyer 101. And um, <laughs> so what we have to do is we have hangar inspections every five years, and we have shiv assembly rebuilds every six years. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is we broke that down into what that, to shiv assemblies every three years. NDT is this year, uh, non-destructive testing uh, for the hangar assemblies, and that's what we're working on. Well, Fast forward again, we're at $50,000 already on our contract because our contract with Doppelmeyer, it spans two fiscal years, okay? So we knew that was coming, so predictively, we put an extra budget in our, in our budget for 2023 uh, to be able to complete this work because we knew it was coming, but we're now coming back to you and saying, we need a little bit more extra money in our 
in our master agreement with Doppelmayr to be able to complete this work. It's already budgeted for. We just need the contract authority to complete the service. And so that is why I'm here today. And what I'm going to do then is come back later this summer with an update of what that th the cost of the full three-year plan is going to be. Assuming that we're already on the first year to three-year plan in 2023, we have 2024 and 2025 to come back, and I'll be giving you an update on that. So that's it in a nutshell. Any oh, questions? I thank you, John. Uh, so now you know everything about Doppelmayr. You know the Sky Ride, and it's very safe. So you need to take John up on this. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to present the motion to approve an amendment to the master agreement with Doppelmayr USA not to exceed $90,000 tax inclusive. Second. I have a second. We're ready for the vote. All in favor? Signify by saying aye. 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 Pass, John. <laughs> now, I asked John, and I know we're late, but there was a lot going on Easter weekend. Yeah. And John just happened to have some really cool pictures <coughs> that will show, because many of you, I'm sure, were not at the Easter egg hunt. But before he starts with that, we want to focus on the team that John has working at Riverfront Park with some really cool things that are starting to happen. Thank you, Jerry. And I, I always like taking the opportunity to brag about the great things we're doing at Riverfront, but I know we're uh, low on time, so I'm gonna brag fast. Uh, <laughs> so first thing, we just opened Tickets and Treats again after um, taking over from Lancer Hospitality. We opened this facility again in six weeks, from idea oh, to concept nice. to opening in six weeks, got all the permits, did all the ordering, specialized menu, all the marketing. Great team effort. You can see it here. It looks vibrant and popping, and so we're really <laughs> excited about that. Please come down, check it out. And they have cappuccino. <laughs> and we have espresso drinks. Yes, <laughs> or espresso yes they are me. professionally made special drinks. Hey, uh, I know it. I knew Jennifer would like yeah. it. Supporting yeah, our on, partners at Thomas Or maybe that's Barb. Oh, well, <laughs> Barb's leaving. Uh, we announced two concerts in March, Modest Mouse and Goose. Uh, but that is in addition to the other six concerts we already had. So we're up to eight, and that meets the uh, AEG's MIM obligation per their contract. And we have more coming. I just can't announce them right now. Hmm. Uh, we hosted the Inlander Best of the Inland Northwest, uh, and that was an awesome opportunity to see how the pavilion can be used in new and different ways, mm. this time as an award show, so that was really cool. Uh, and we uh, Parks ran, uh, received several awards for being the best of, so that's really cool. Thirteen. Whoa. Wow. <laughs> Are we counting? Congrats. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, we started a new event in March called Leprechaun Gold. Uh, we hid gold coins, as you see up here on the screen, around the park, 50 of them. They're about an inch and a half in diameter. Uh, they're heavy. Uh, and at, um, of the coins that were found, only 25 were redeemed for the free carousel ride. The others were kept. But the positive note here <laughs> was all? that it cost <laughs> us about... They're gold. It cost us about $200. And we got 500 extra people in the park. And we had uh, a lot of... Um, point of sale transactions because of that engagement. So the, that's, a, that's a really good way, low cost way that we're able to get engagement from a, a new activity in a traditionally low season, low area. Uh, we brought in five, I know I'm showing only four interpretive signs, but we brought in five interpretive signs last month. These are all of them, the Loop Carousel, US Pavilion, Theme Stream, and Bill Fern Conservation Area. In addition, not shown, is the Clock Tower. So the Clock Tower theme stream and the U.S. Pavilion are Expo-themed signs, and so we're really excited about that. That is just hopefully the first of many that we'll be launching and putting into the park. And here we go into the Easter celebration. So oh, last, wow. uh, last Saturday, we hosted our annual Easter egg hunt. We've been doing this for about three to four years now. This was the biggest and best we've had to date. And a lot of it is because of lessons learned we had over time. But also, our staff is great in creating partnerships that matter. So we've partnered with uh, One Heart and Isaac Foundation to provide just an amazing experience for the public. Here you see the whole Clock Tower Meadow 
just for the zero to two year olds. Okay. <laughs> and wow. all we have, and Nick Hammett is in there someplace. Because <laughs> um, he's only two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we had uh, the Lilac Bowl for the six plus, and we had Havermail Point for the three to fives, and we had over 20,000 eggs all together. Oh and so that was a really cool story to tell, but there's more. We did, for the first time only, we did a sensory Easter egg hunt at the Providence Playscape mm -hmm. with the Isaac Foundation, okay. and we really tried to bring equality to everyone. And this, they, uh, so those who wanted to participate had to register in advance. We had a limited space available, but you could tell it really turned out to be an amazing experience. Uh, think about a child in a wheelchair for the first mm -hmm. time being able to Easter egg hunt. It's great. Yeah. Right? That's an amazing experience to tell, and we really thank our partners for working with us. And so this is some really, these are some really uh, cool pictures uh, to show about that experience. And so we're really happy that we're really trying to work with the community, work with our partners to bring activities that people love and bring joy to our community. So, and that is it. That's my report. Thank you, John, nice, so John. much. I appreciate nice. it. And it was That's a beautiful awesome. day it was. for Great. Easter. So. Thank you, John. And with that, yes, Riverfront Park will be meeting again at Riverfront Pavilion, May 8th at 4 p.m. Thank you, Jerry. And awesome. we're all uh, in, still inviting everyone on the board to come do the sky ride. So put it on your calendar. So, Nick, you are up with the golf committee. All right. Uh, golf did meet. We had an action item that was on the consent agenda. Um, I'll make this quick. We all know all four courses are now open. Please come out and play golf. We've got a late start due to the weather. We kind of had a weird ending last year. So um, tell all your friends and family to come out and play golf. Um, there's some great things going on. All the youth programs are starting to spin up, which is awesome. You know, anytime we can get the youth involved in golf, um, just continues to grow the sport for the future. Uh, the men's and ladies clubs are starting to spin up as well. Um, we've got some job openings, some permanent job openings, which are giving more opportunities to folks to, to have a career path in our golf courses, which is going to be amazing. And um, just I think once the weather starts to get a little bit better, um, our, our numbers will pick up and um, the courses will be in amazing shape. So, so come out and play golf. Our next meeting is at the Hive on May 9th at 8 a.m. and I'm still gonna try to figure out a way for us to do these at the golf courses. I've got some ideas. All right. <laughs> Thank this you. IT background. That's right. <laughs> well, I'll move ahead then with the finance committee. I'm not gonna hurry because I enjoy being here so darn much. So. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> anyway, the finance committee, we met Tuesday, April 11th and it was in hybrid format. There were no action items, but we had a discussion item that maybe started in land, I don't know, but we discussed the Suzy Trail development, and that still hinges on fundraising. The proposed trail, it was bro it's been broken into three segments in order to facilitate the completion of at least one. Uh, the proposed, that proposed section was bid out at $200,000, and thanks to a generous donation from Nancy Mackerel, half of that has been raised. Parks hopes to start the initial section or they hope to start that initial section in May sometime. So that's what we're waiting for, and hopefully we can get that uh, at least the first part of the, the Suzy Trails developed. Rick Lentz presented the March financials, including a recap of the Riverfront Park bond, which has a balance of $746,221, and that's due to accrued interest. A majority of this amount of this amount is already committed to the West Haver Mill parking lot, and the start of its construction awaits the completion of the Post Street Bridge. <laughs> Park's operating budget following the recent path, it follows the recent path of operating expenses increasing more than operating revenue. This trend illustrates why Park needs to develop new revenue channels, and we've talked about that enough before. And weather was the primary factor in golf's weak first quarter performance. The meeting was adjourned at 3.59 p.m. And our next meeting will be May 9th, 2023, in the Liberty Park Library Events Room. And Jennifer, you're next with the DVC. All right, so the DVC meeting was canceled for March due to its proximity to the Park Board Retreat. However, the next meeting will be April 19th in the Lilac Conference Room on the first floor of City Hall. 
and the DVCAC did meet, and Kelly was going to give a little tiny recap, a quick little recap. <laughs> Just a basic update that our group went through each other's fundraising and upcoming events. Uh, the minutes are available online, and Lee Williams from uh, Coeur d'Alene Park will give a full report to the DVC next time. Yeah, she gave a great presentation at the CAC. Thank you, Kelly. So, already mentioned the next meeting? Off, off oh, right, thank you. So then we'll move down to reports. The president's report, while well, I'm, I'm up again. Um, I appreciate the effective communications from all the board members, the parks team, and the guest speakers at the March retreat. And we're planning to have another retreat in the fall and looking forward to future input from the board members. And it's great to see how parks took the information we gave them, the questions we had, and came up with the presentations that really helped us, I think, through today as far as helped help develop our understanding, help answer questions before we knew we had them. So thanks to everyone for making that, uh, that possible. Uh, Christina has a, a special announcement to the board, and so the floor is yours. Right, thanks, Bob. So I um, wanted to let the board know that I have um, had an amazing opportunity to take an, a job in Seattle. Um, as the Associate Vice President of Communications for Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center. Oh, wow. That's wow. Um, and so it was a very difficult decision to make. Uh, Spokane is my home. I was born and raised here. And we will still remain here in part. We will still be residents, but we will also be residents of Seattle, so I can take this opportunity, which also means that part of making that decision means that I cannot fulfill my responsibilities on this board in the way that I think is fair as a citizen and as someone who cares deeply about parks. So I have notified Bob of my resignation slash helping us seamlessly move forward in this process. So I will continue in this role as long as needed until an alternative is found to replace my position. Thank you, Christina. Certainly appreciate everything you've done for the board. You've been a great member. Um, in the conversations that Christina and I had, we will look for a new board member. We will start the process. Christina can still continue to work virtually with us. Um, I know someone was asked, well, do you, don't you need to be a resident of Spokane? As far as if you have a mailing address here, I think that still makes you a resident, and I believe you told me that you and your husband, anyway, the... We'll, be, we'll still be here. We will still have our home. Yeah. I just will not always be physically present in the city every yeah. day. So, I, I, you know, I appreciate your willingness to work with us. We know that kind of like some of the city employment things, it doesn't always happen overnight when you look for somebody new. So we will start the process, and thank you, Christina, for all you've done, and thank you for being, being willing to continue working with us. Thank um, you. Thank you all. Just a couple more things. Uh, due to the limited response to my email requesting board members who are able to commit to the requirements, including bi-monthly meetings with no virtual options for the executive committee charter, I have selected four members who will work out a schedule that will have two members present at all, at all meetings. So Jennifer, Kevin, Jerry, and myself will comprise this committee and we will work on scheduling to get that going. It's an extremely important committee as we all know, it's uh, the start to the future that we need. Uh, final thing, mark your calendars for the ribbon cutting of the Stepwell on Saturday, May 6th mm -hmm. at 11 a.m. That's one day before the Bloomsday race. We should have a lot of visitors in town. Mm -hmm. And just in closing my report, thank you all for you, all you've done today. I know it was a, or still is a lengthy meeting, and everyone has certainly devoted their time to this, and I, I appreciate it. So other reports, uh, who would be next? Me and I have no... Well, thank you, Nick. Nothing, to, <laughs> nothing to, to report. Okay. And the next one would be Barb, the Parks Foundation. And I have nothing to report. You guys are just trying to wing it to get through. <laughs> <laughs> and 
Councilman Bingle didn't even show up, so we can't even ask <laughs> no, him. Nothing to report. He said the last three, three for At three. At least we're here. <laughs> then we'll go to yes, right, Then we'll go to Director uh, Garrett Chilton. All right, real quickly. Great meeting. Thank you. It was a lot of information uh, thrown out the board today, but I think it was a great process and a great outcome. And I want to thank to the citizens for coming out and voicing their comments as well. Um, I also want to thank our clerk team that has been working tirelessly with the library crew and our great partnership that we have with libraries. Uh, one of the primary goals was trying to get out of City Hall for our committees to be not only a better access for our board members and staff, but also citizens that want to come and participate as well. So can't thank the clerk team enough. And then again, um, want to thank our golf course superintendents. I've been able to chat with all of them with one of the most difficult uh, winners on record to be able to open up the golf courses in the shape they are is pretty remarkable. And then thank you, Christina, for your uh, commitment to this board. And thank you for the uh, great comments, great ideas, and your communication that you've had with the staff. So really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure. Sorry to lose bone. you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to go. <laughs> Anything else? I just would like to say, Christina, been on the west side, and I know this is where you grew up, but where you're going in the firm in which you've been requested to report is outstanding. Mm -hmm. So it's congratulations. Thank great. you. All right, if nothing else. All right. <laughs> then let's go ahead and we will adjourn at 550. Again, thank you all for your time, your efforts today. Oh, it was well done. Oops. I know. Oh, my gosh. That. Yes. That's a record. <laughs>